Yesterday, I was on the front cover of the New York Times, the print edition, as part of a montage like this, a collage like this. However, I'm not on the web one, and I'm rather disappointed about that. It's really sad. Caleb Kane was a, U a college dropout looking for direction. He turned to YouTube. What have we got here? Philip DeFranco, Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, uh, Milton Friedman, <laughs> Confusing Forever, alongside Stefan Molyneux, Lauren Southern, uh, Gavin McInnes, and Milo Yiannopoulos, and Dr. Random Acam, and Alex Jones, and Big Man Tyrone, the President of Kakistan. What a fair selection of people that is. Probably all people worth subscribing to, frankly, isn't it? Probably all people who are really entertaining to watch. Let's be honest. The complaint about this piece is, as you can imagine, I was brainwashed by watching right-wing, quote-unquote, videos. Now, if you mean my political opinions changed when I watched these videos, then maybe they did. And uh, there's a there's a part down here that I just want to quote because this is the this is the bit I think is interesting. Um, here's the number of videos he apparently watched each month. Now I find it weird that he would be documenting this uh, back in 2015. I find that really strange. But he decided to watch right wing content, and then for some reason in 2017 he decided to watch left wing content. This is because the YouTube algorithm was apparently promoting these videos to him. Well, I wonder why that was. I wonder if that's got anything to do with YouTube changing the algorithm due to mass online pressure from left-wingers who are getting their asses handed to them on YouTube. Anyway, so basically they start, they, they start with this. Broken depressed, he resolved to get his act together because he was just a, a nobody, a no-account kid. He began looking for help in the same place he looked for everything, YouTube. And he found them. And he found Stefan Molyneux and then started watching other things. Here's a snapshot of what he watched. I don't know. It's just the sort of, you know, anti-SJW sphere. I mean, some of this looks all pretty good. Like like Janice Fiamenko. <laughs> like, what a radical right-winger. She's just one of those people who talks against feminism. But um, feminism was a recurring theme. Yes, I can imagine that it is. I can imagine that feminism is a recurring theme, given the dominance feminism has in the West at the moment. I mean, it's insane, to be honest. But anyway, so um, over time, he watched Dublin's Cliffs, Stephen Crowder, blah, 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 blah. To Mr. Kane, all of this felt like forbidden knowledge, as if just by watching some YouTube videos, he'd been let into an exclusive club. When I found this stuff, I felt like I was chasing uncomfortable truths. I felt like it was giving me power and respect and authority. Well, okay, but let's be honest, a lot of this is forbidden knowledge, which is why they are currently trying to censor us. This article itself is an attempt to add to the kind of cavalcade of Twitter and uh, the, the narrative that is surrounding YouTube that's being created by the left-wingers. My God, YouTube's making everyone right-wing. They're telling them to right-wing radicals on YouTube. Or they're just giving them information that is being left out of progressive narratives in order to make people progressive, to radicalize people to the left, which is the only way this can happen. The only way it happens is when you leave out half of the story, the bits that are inconvenient to your narrative and don't push it in the direction you want, which tend to keep people in the reasonable center. That's why it is forbidden knowledge. It's stuff that is literally not being told to you. But anyway, we, uh, we carry on with this, the whining about the algorithm, and then we get to what they are actually promoting in response all the way down here. In fact, it keeps going, doesn't it? Blimey. I did read through this, by the way. Um, there we go. We finally get to ContraPoints and what they call BreadTube. This is... Um, the, a new kind of video began appearing as recommendations when the SJW started whining. Uh, this is the core of BreadTube strategy. BreadTube is named after named after the left-wing anarchist Peter Kropotkin's 1892 book, The Conquest of Bread. I actually have a script uh, for this that I never recorded, 
uh, which was an analysis of it, just a breakdown of it and um, <laughs> a deconstruction of it. It's essentially the most anachronistic thing you can imagine. It's how can we guarantee everyone has bread every day? Well, sure, if you're a Russian in 1892, getting your daily bread probably is a major concern, but it's rather not at this point while we have an obesity crisis amongst our poor people. But anyway, it's a communist book. It's He was a communist. You know, he was a, a radical leftist. He, and I mean a radical as well. He was, you know, he was a revolutionary, like, overthrow everything type. So, yeah, th this group calls itself BreadTube. Oh, it's YouTube's radicalizing people, but not in the right way. So we want to radicalize them in the right way. I mean, it's just unreal. Oliver Thorne, a British philosopher who hosts the channel Philosophy Tube, who is a radical leftist, about makes topics like transphobia, racism, and Marxist economics bit of a contradiction in terms but okay yeah he's a radical leftist he justifies antifa he is not a moderate and yet he has been presented in neutral moderate terms the core of bread tube strategy is kind of algorithmic hijacking by talking about many of the same topics that far-right creators do in some cases responding directly to their videos left-wing youtubers are able to get their videos recommended to the same audience okay like and this, that's how we ended up getting noticed by feminist watching uh, people. That's fine. That's just how it works. People talking about topics creates a milieu of topics that people get to talk, get to th uh, see from different different perspectives. Okay, that's fine. No one's complaining about that, but that's not where it ends. This is just a part of the larger game. I mean, Carlos is still going on about. Pretty frustrating to see straight journalists talking about how to deal with anti-LGBT harassment on YouTube without talking to LGBT, LGBT people, blah, 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 blah. He's been going on this for days because there is no particular limiting principle at this point. YouTube accept that there is, oh God, you know, Stephen Crowder's audience or someone is sending Carlos Maza stuff, apparently. Well, we need to do something about that. Quick, demonetize Stephen Crowder. And Carlos went, right, great, keep going. You haven't done enough. You haven't done enough. I'll do a proper video on this tomorrow. Um, and so this is why we come to the term freedom of speech trending on Twitter today. Now, you might remember back in May that Donald Trump said, I'm continuing to monitor the censorship of American citizens on social media platforms. This is the United States of America, and we have what's known as freedom of speech. We are monitoring and watching closely. 55,000 retweets, 200,000 likes. Not long after this, the White House uh, posted a link for people to fill in their own examples of social media censorship. So I imagine that's going to be a very useful thing because he's obviously creating a case when he comes to the 2020 elections to do something at the same time he also retweeted paul joseph watson and people like him um which is absolutely brilliant i mean you know it's honestly it's the it's just so fantastic that donald trump is woke on the problem that is happening in silicon valley and it is censorship he is every note correct in this tweet every note you know monitoring the censorship of american citizens on social media platforms not just but we're relying on you guys americans come on you know you you're the bastion of freedom you've got to do this and so today a couple of months later a month later um freedom of speech is now again trending on twitter because Twitter should let the banned conservative voices back onto their platform without restriction. It's called freedom of speech. Remember, you are making a giant mistake. Now, to me, that has the ominous tones of a final warning. It would seem that Trump has laid the groundwork in advance. He says, I'm watching. Stop deplatforming. Now let them back on or you are making a giant mistake. The man is not known for not following through on what he's saying. And I don't know what to say. But the wall, yeah, okay, he's not a he's not a tyrant, but he is doing things. I mean, look at the Mexico stuff of the tariffs. What is in his power, he will do. So let's give him some credit here and say, right, he's probably got something under the hood that we can't see yet. But hopefully, soon it will be time for the big reveal. To be honest with you, I hope it's that he decides to close his Twitter account and go to Gab. I really really hope that that's what he's going to do because everyone's like oh god what can he do what can he do oh you know he can't he can't start censoring people or like you know forcing silicon valley to do stuff no he can't but he can go to platforms that are outside of silicon valley they aren't actually the only game in town and wouldn't that be an interesting thing to do because what are the journalists going to do what are people like eugene goo md going to do trump has no idea what he's talking about when he rants about freedom of speech 
Who cares? Who gives a fuck, dude? Like, Twitter should let the banned conservative voices back onto their platform. I guess I would fall into that category these days. You know, me, fucking Milo, any of the other types, you know, the sort of, like, provocateur types, you should let us back on. You should, Alex Jones, what did he do wrong? You know, really, on Twitter, apparently not much. But anyway, it is called freedom of speech, and it's a principle. It's a spirit of the thing. Even if technically a constitutional amendment wouldn't change what's happening here, it's still wrong to operate our society this way. It's like malicious compliance, essentially. Why do it? He literally bro- blocked a bunch of people. So fucking what? So what if he is blocking people? That's That should be fine, but, as you say, this is a public forum under his tweets. And unfortunately, Eugene, as soon as you say that, and I agree with you, it is, I completely agree with you that it is, but then the question is, by what right do you exclude anyone from this public forum? Why should anyone, especially Americans, not be able to access Donald Trump's Twitter account, using a Twitter account so they can reply as well? Why? You can't justify banning people from Twitter with your logic here. In fact, your logic, if believe it or not, completely reinforces Donald Trump's logic. Even if he doesn't know anything about it and he just says this with a no knowledge, some, maybe someone wrote this for him, right? It doesn't matter because you are in agreement. You can, you're in complete agreement. You're just saying, I don't like Donald Trump because I think he's an idiot. Okay, let's assume he is. He's still right and you agree. The seven of us, with the generous pro bono help of Knight First Amendment Institute, sued Trump in the federal district court and won. We then helped get many other Twitter users unblocked so that more dissenting critics may participate in this forum. Okay, that sounds great. Except for the ones you don't like. Except for the critics who are in his favor against you. What are you doing about Jack Dorsey banning people from a platform that he literally said on Joe Rogan that is a human right to use social media? And yet, instead of saying, I mean, imagine if a dictator came out and said, well, of course, everyone's got a human right to exist in our democracy, and then just start shooting people in the fucking head. Well, why, why are you shooting those people? Well, I really don't like them. But everyone's got a right to live, obviously, just not these people, because I don't like them. That's what you're supporting, Eugene. That's the, the Twitter is doing the digital e- equivalent of this, saying, no, we just don't like those people. But the Krasenstein brothers used to be a huge present here, presence here, now they're gone. Oh, so it matters when it's the Krasensteins, does it? That's when it matters. And let's be honest, the Krasensteins weren't banned because of their opinions. They were banned for circumventing the rules on, like, bots and second accounts and all this sort of nonsense. Right? So they weren't actually banned because of politics. They were banned because they were actually manipulating Twitter's algorithms. But hey, that's fine. We'll overlook that. doesn't matter. I mean, it wasn't hate speech. Therefore, you know, fuck me. The whole thing is really quite, it is genuinely a powder keg after Vox's attack on Stephen Crowder and the thousands of other people who are either demonetized or just deplatformed outright. And now they're still going. And when Trump's saying, look, maybe we should all be on these platforms, these shitheads who have got Trump derangement syndrome don't even realize that they are in agreement with him when he says this. It's just anything Donald Trump says, we have to oppose. God bless the God Emperor. God Emperor of Mankind 2020. That's all I'm saying.